So I got to be honest with you guys. I am so glad that I got to see that before I got up to preach. <laughs> Honestly, I was like, oh, I, I was really scared when that popped up the first time. Like, oh, we got problems. But anyway, but it's, it's, it's worked out fine. Um, this month, actually, we're getting to, uh, going to have four different uh, speakers. Me, Brandon, um, a couple of the other guys, we're going to get up and speak. Each one of us is going to share what God's put on our hearts, whatever messages is that we, we get to, to share. And, and today I want to talk to you about something that I have been thinking on for a while. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a man in Scripture that really I, I, I see as such an example for me, somebody I want to follow, and I wanted to share this with you. There's a chance you may have never heard this man's story. You, you may have heard about some of the things he was involved in, but there's a chance that you just completely skipped this guy without knowing it, and it's a really cool story. So we're going to dig into this story today. We're going to talk a lot um, about well, something that hits close to home. We're going to talk about fear. Um, in 2016, uh, we moved here from, from Oklahoma. Um, it's actually almost been six years now. It'll be six years next month, which has really gone fast, right? It doesn't seem like six years ago. Um, but I have a daughter now that will be leaving to college next week, and when she, she showed up, she was, well, I guess she was in seventh grade, going into 13th grade now. So that's how that works. Um, it's crazy to watch as time goes, but we did not want to leave. Um, didn't want to leave Oklahoma. I had good friends there, had family there. Um, it, it, was, it was home for us, but there were many reasons not to leave. One of them, though, and maybe the main, run, main one had, uh, if I'm going to be honest with you, it was a question that was banging in the back of my mind. And, and, the, and the question was this, do I have what it takes? The popped up immediately. Um, the very first conversation I had uh, with, with Brandon about this role when they called and asked if I'd be interested in coming out here, um, immediately I was like, this is not going to work. I, I am a small town guy. I mean, I grew up in Albuquerque, uh, but I was born in a small town. I got back to a small town as fast as I could. I'm, I'm a small town guy. Small churches are what I know. Small churches. I was in a church that was in a town of 1,500 and a church of 100 people. You know, super small town. It's what I knew and it was what I was comfortable with. And, and coming out here and, and doing what I do, building small groups and, and getting to share with, with you guys. You guys are smart. The people I had in Oklahoma, they were smart too, but they weren't like Sandia Labs smart, right? It's a different type of smart that we're dealing with here. It scared me on that. There were so many things that really pushed against my capability to be able to come out and do this. And I was inundated with this question, do I have what it takes? It scared me. I actually had a friend who had a cabin um, in Oklahoma on a pond, and I asked him, hey, can I borrow your cabin for 24 hours? And uh, he said, sure. So I left my cell phone at home and, and uh, left all my technology. It was just me and my Bible and a fishing pole. And I, and I went out to this cabin, and I sat, and I read, and I prayed, and I fished, and I read, and I prayed, and I slept, and I did these things, just seeking God's will for this. I asked my wife if she thought we should do this, and she's like, she said she prayed about it, and then she came back, she said, look, I really feel like God wants me to have you make the decision, so I'm going to leave this up to you. Thanks. I she sabotaged me on that, but um, I went, and I spent my time in prayer there, and I was overcome in reading scripture with an understanding that I had spent really my entire life only doing things that I knew I could do under my own strength, out of fear. I would only take challenges that I knew I could accomplish. I would only go to the, dis I would only go to the distance or go the distance uh, on things that I knew that I was going to be able to get done. I, I wouldn't take on things larger than myself because I was afraid. I don't think I'm alone in this. I don't think I'm alone in this at all. I think many of us are afraid. We're afraid to have the conversations that we need to know, that we know that we need to have. We're afraid to do things that we know God wants us to do. I don't care if you're an 80-year-old grandma, if, if you're a 20-year-old guy. I know that there are guys in this room who would not have a problem and are not scared if somebody were to come in this door ready to, to harm one of us. There are guys in this room who would not have a problem standing up and making sure that, that we were safe. But those same guys, because I've talked to guys like that, are deathly afraid to have the conversations that they need to have with their kids about Jesus because of guilt that they have over things that they've done in their past. Right? That fear, the fear that we have, it, it cripples us, it paralyzes us, it shuts us down from being the men and women that, that God has built us to be. And there are things that 
God, God wants us to do for the kingdom of God that we're afraid to accomplish. Something I want you to know this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is talking to Timothy. Timothy was a, a minister in a church, but he was young and he was afraid. And, and Paul writes to him this, he says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. God did not intend for us to be afraid. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're, you, he, he, he has not positioned you and built you so that you would walk in fear. That fear actually doesn't come from his Holy Spirit. He makes it so that we can be bold, so that we can be honest, so that we can be powerful for him. So today we're going to talk about that, and we're going to dig into a story um, actually starting in Numbers. We're actually going to look at Numbers, and we're going to be looking in Joshua after that. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Numbers 13. If you don't have a Bible, there's one like this in the seat in front of you, and we're going to be on page 121 um, to start, and then we're going to go from there back up to um, a little further as we work our way back. But in this passage, let me set, set the scene for you guys here so you can know what's going on. So um, God had set aside his people. The, the, the Jewish people were people he had called to himself, and, and they were in slavery in Egypt, in Egypt for 400 years, enslaved by the Egyptians. And then God set them free. He took them out. You guys will remember the story of the ten plagues, maybe. And, and he took them out of Egypt, and he delivered them. And then they spent a year... Um, in the, on the Sinai Peninsula, they were in the desert, just getting to know God. They got the Ten Commandments, and God fed them, and gave them water, and took care of them. And now, at the end of that year, they're about to go into this land that he has promised them, this land flowing with milk and honey. It was a, a special land set aside for them. He had got this ready for them, and he said, I want you to go. You're going to go into this land, and there are people there. You're going to go, and you're going to fight them, and I'm going to give them over to you. This land is going to be your land. It's going to be awesome. Just go. And so they're on the border of the land. They send 12 people across to go look at the land and to go spy it out. And when they come back, the, the 12 guys come back with these huge clusters of grapes and fruit and awesome stuff and stories. And that's where we pick up today in Numbers 13, 25 through 33. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came, I'm sorry, I lost my spot here. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness at Paran, at Kadesh. And they brought back word with them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land in the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell in the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we, will be a, we are able, we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone with him said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw in it are of great height. And we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. So these guys went into this land, and they, they scouted it out, and they came back and they said, hey, it really is awesome. This, this place that God promised us, it really is beautiful. And Caleb's like, yes, it is. Let's go. We can go take it. And the rest of the guys, 10 of the guys, Joshua said there quietly, but the other 10 said, uh, one problem. The people there are too strong for us. The land is too big for us. These, these, these cities are strong. They've got, they've got uh, walls, up the, uh, walls built up. They're defensed. They're, they're defensible positions. We can't do it. And there are giants there, guys like Goliath later on, right? Goliath would be a descendant of these guys. There are giants there. There are people there that are huge. We can't do this. And they got scared. Here's the thing. They were right. A year ago, these guys had been slaves in Egypt. They'd never been trained for war. Their parents had been slaves. Their grandparents had been slaves. For 400 years, their families had been slaves. They'd never known how to run a sword, an arrow, a bow. 
They had every right to be afraid. But, Caleb stands up and says, guys, we can do this. And there's a reason he says that. You see, for the last year, Caleb had got to know God. A year ago, Caleb had been in Egypt, and then God sent ten plagues to, to, to open the eyes of the Egyptians so that the Egyptians would let the, the Israelites go. And they finally let him go. And the Israelites go, and they, they, they start to get away, and then the Egyptians say, we should just go get him now. We shouldn't have done this. Let's go get him back. And so they bring their army, and the Israelites are, are stuck on the edge of the Red Sea. And if you remember this story, God split open the Red Sea so that the people could walk through the water with walls of water on each side on dry ground. How cool would that have been? I wish I could have been there because I'd have been the stupid guy that walked over and went like, boop, like poked a hole in the water. <laughs> anyway, it would have been fun. But it would be amazing to see this. And then when they got across the Red Sea, the, the water uh, flushed back on. And the, and the Egyptians, as they're going through, they, they got stuck inside the water. And then once they're on the other side, they start to get thirsty. And God says, Moses, hit the rock. He hits the rock, and water comes out of the rock. They start to get hungry. And God says, hey, I'm going to give you food every morning. This is going to be this manna. Manna means what is it? Because we don't even know what it is. But it's going to be food on the ground, and it's going to taste like a honey bread. And it's going to be there for you every single day. So for the last year, Caleb had seen God doing all of these miracles, and he realized, wait, if God did this, and now he promised us this land, why should I be scared? If God promised he's going to do it, what am I afraid of? Why are we so scared if God promised it? I know that those guys are bigger than us. But the Egyptians were bigger than us. I know that those guys are stronger than us, but the water was stronger than us. I know that those guys are more powerful than us. Well, our hunger was pretty powerful and that God took care of our hunger. I know that we should be scared by the, the realities of this world, but God seems to be bigger than this, and so let's go. But, you see, the people were asking, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes to do this? Do I have what it takes to make this happen? We don't have what it takes. And Caleb basically says, you're asking the wrong question. It's not about us in the first place. It's about him. And so God says this through Caleb, and Caleb stands up, but the people, the people hear this. Pretty soon, they, they, they start to listen to the ten more than the two because the ten sound like they're smarter. It makes sense. We should be afraid. And, and pretty soon, you got two million people going into like mob rebellion against God, and, and they, they ultimately want to go and say, let's just, let's just kill these guys who led us. We'll kill Moses, we'll kill all these people, and we'll go back to Egypt where at least we had food. With that, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 5, we pick up. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all of the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and said to the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is exceedingly good. It is, is, is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they're bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation set to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared on the tent of meeting and all the people of Israel. So Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb are standing there and they're saying, God's got this. And Joshua actually, or Caleb says, look, this land is good. God is faithful. If we trust him, he's going to give us what it is that he promised. And the people stood up and they got ready to stone him to death because they didn't want to hear it. What I want to notice, though, is what Caleb says. Because what he says is really powerful. When he says, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us into the land that he gave us, to give it to us. And the land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and don't fear the people of the land for they're bred for us. The protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. I love this because Caleb, what he does is he focuses, instead of on the, the, the fear right in front of him and the fear in front of everybody else, instead of focusing on these things, he says, look, 
Maybe we're not seeing this from the right perspective. One, he, he, he sees the blessing instead of the obstacle. And so when he looks at this, he sees this great land instead of seeing all the reasons why it's not going to work. I'm really good at finding all the reasons why something's not going to work. Any of you guys that way? Right, you can find that it's not going to work. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do that. That's too much of a challenge. This isn't going to be this way. It's not going to work out right. It's not going And instead of doing that, what Caleb does, he says, no, no, God says that he's going to do this. And if I look at the land, it really is a land flowing with milk and honey. He promised us. He brought us this far. If he's going to bring us this far, why wouldn't he finish the job? And he trusts. He trusts in God. If we're having an honest conversation, most of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, the reason you gave your life to Jesus is because you saw God do something great. You heard God's word speak to you in a way that nothing else in this world ever has. You've seen God work miracles around you. You've seen God heal people. You've seen God bring people into your life. You've seen God bring you into other people's lives. And, and you've seen God do great things. Most of us are here today because we've seen God do things. And yet, we don't trust God for tomorrow. We worry. We doubt. Jesus tells, tells us, do, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And yet, some of us have ulcers from worry. We live in this place of worry and fear because we really don't trust God. We've seen him work in the past, but we don't know that he's going to show up again. That's not how Caleb looked at life. He, 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 he does. He, he, he sees the blessing instead of the obstacle. He trusts God in the thirdly. And I love this. He builds up the faith of those around him. He says to the people, look, God, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be bread for us. They're, they're, their stuff, they're going to take you. Their stuff is going to be for us. Their, uh, their walls are, are, are not defensible. Nothing is going to work out for them. God has got this. He sees that God is on their side and he's not afraid. Instead of asking, do I have what it takes? He focuses on the God that promises that he's going to take care of this. He does this because he has seen God bring water out of a rock and he has seen God do these things and he's going to work now. In 1 John chapter 4, John tells us this. He says, talking about people who are against God versus the followers of Jesus, he says, little, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. But the one that is in us is greater than the one that is in the world. The God that is for us is stronger than the enemies of darkness that stand against us. Satan tries to get us to buy into being afraid, to, into, into having doubts and these worries and these fears, and we end up in a place where we don't move, we're paralyzed. And that's where these people were. And so God actually, with the, uh, with the people of Israel, is, 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 is angry. But instead of striking them all dead, he forgives them. Instead of getting, saying, okay, go back to Egypt, he forgives them. But he does something interesting. He, he, he does not let those people go back. We read about this in Numbers 14, 20 through 24. He won't let them go into the new land. So he says this, Then the Lord says, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers and none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which we, he went and his descendants shall possess it. So God says this, and this is crazy. Not crazy, it's, it's just hard. Um, right? this, this, this is wild. He, he says, I'm not going to make it so you guys don't get to go. Your children are going to go, get to go into this land. Your children are going to get to see all of this land. But all of you adults who, who grew up in Egypt and got to see all these miracles and are now doubting me, well, we're going to live in the desert until all of you guys pass away. 
Caleb, I'm going to keep alive. And Caleb is going to get to see this land, but he's going to have to wait. And so here's what happens. For the next 40 years, 40 years, the people of God live in the desert. And while they're there in the desert, uh, they, they get to experience more of God's power. They get to eat the manna off the ground, but they don't get to go into the promised land. They start to tell their kids about how amazing God is, and they build this relationship, but they don't get to go into the land. And that entire time, Caleb is there with them. You know how I would be if I was Caleb? I'd be whining. You people, you people did this to me. I'm stuck here because of you. But instead, Caleb waits, and he waits, and he waits. And so now what I want to do is I want to hop in a time machine. We're going to go 40 years forward, actually 45, and we're going to jump to Joshua chapter 14. All right, so Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, and this will be the end of the story with Caleb. I love this part. This is why I wanted to talk about this sermon, was this passage right here. Caleb, in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, says this, and this is now 45 years later. The Israelites have gone into the land. They've gone and they've started to fight, and what God said he was going to do, he did. He fought for them. You guys may have heard the story in Sunday school of walking around the walls of Jericho and the walls all come down. That's God saying, they're not defensible. I'm going to take care of it. And he did this 40, 40 years, so 45 years later. So we've got four year, 40 years in the desert and then five years of fighting. We pick up right here. They've been fighting and winning victories, but there's a small area to be taken. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of God, Servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the land has kept me alive, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said. These 45 years since the time the Lord spoke this to Moses while Israel was still in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was on the days that Moses sent me. My strength now is, 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 as, it, is, my, my strength now is as it was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country on which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Caleb has been waiting 45 years for this promise and he shows up to Joshua and he says, Hey Joshua, those Anakim, those giants, they're, they're still there. The hill country is still there. But this crazy thing happened. God has kept me strong, and I'm ready. I want to go fight. I'm ready to go. Look, how many of you guys at 85 years old are dreaming about the time when you're 85 years old so you can go climbing up mountains going to war? Anybody? Or how many of you guys would much rather have a ranch in the valley than go fighting in the mountains at 85? Right? This is where we, be. This is where we want to be, right? Some of us are working that way right now. We're building towards that. You know why the hill country had not been taken yet? Because the hills are the hardest to fight in. But Caleb realized, God is in front of me. And if he's brought me this far, let's finish the job. Let's go. There's a reason he's kept me strong. There's a reason he's kept me here. And as long as he's got me here, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to go. Why is he that way? Because we see three times in this passage, it says, Caleb wholeheartedly followed God. The only thing, difference between you and me and Caleb is that Caleb was singularly focused on the promises of God. And because of that, his fear melted away. If you've walked with God long enough, you know, that, you know what that's like when you, when you start to actually read the Word, when you start to pray, when you start to walk, it, you find that the things that you're so afraid of in this world start to seem like not that big of a deal anymore. For Caleb, at this moment, he finally sees that it is time, and he is ready to go. Caleb wasn't worried about whether or not he was good enough. Caleb wasn't worried about whether or not he had what it takes. 
Because he served the God who did. And when he got rid of that question, ultimately it made for an amazing legacy. He was able and he was go, able to go and fight against these people who were against God. He was able to go and he was able to take the hill country. He was able to do what nobody else would, could, nobody else could do. And that brings us to today. Because as far as I know, nobody in this room has been promised to go to war and take the hill country. So what does this sermon even have to do with us? The reality is, we're not necessarily afraid of those things, but we are deathly afraid, oftentimes, of doing what it is that God wants us to do. We are afraid of rejection, we're afraid of being alone, and we're afraid of dying. And so... We don't have the conversations that we need to have and we don't do the things that God has put in front of us to do because we're afraid of how people are going to respond. We don't reach out to people and share the love of Jesus with people. We don't stand up in boldness because we're afraid. And ultimately we're afraid of dying and we're afraid of what that all means. Like, I, I feel like I got kind of the raw end of the deal today when it comes down to the order of the service in the video. Um, just before I got up to preach, there was the, the video with, with Malia. Uh, Malia, who passed away this last week, she was a really neat girl. Um, she's a friend of my, my daughter, friend of a bunch of my, my daughter's friends. Um, just a, an amazing young woman. She went to CIY with our church this last month, and while she was there, she... Uh, told one of our um, youth leaders that she felt God putting a calling on her heart to get to minister to people, and she was excited about what God was doing in her life. And here she is a month later dead. How do we reconcile that? That's our fear, right? How do we reconcile that? This last Wednesday... I was here, and we actually had a bunch of adults here. Um, we had 60 kids up here, uh, and they were all in here worshiping and singing, and, and something amazing happened. We had adults here ready to pray with these kids and to talk with these kids as they, they dealt with the pain, the worry about Malia. They, we didn't know that she had passed away yet, but knew that it was probably coming. We were praying for God to heal. And there was fear. Something amazing happened that night. I watched as kids came and and they they bowed bowed down here and they prayed. And I saw other kids come and pray over these kids. And 55, 60 kids, you saw these kids and not one of them is sitting there just staring at their cell phone. Not one of them is messing around. All of them were praying for each other. They were walking for each other. They were hugging each other and they were praying, praying over each other in boldness to the place where the adults are just standing in the back like, We don't have anything to do because they are ministering to each other. They were lifting each other up. Because of what God was doing through Malia, these students grew in their relationship with God and each other in a powerful way. Malia today, because of the work of Jesus, hasn't died, she's moved. See, Caleb had this promise. He had this promise of a, of a mountain, of a hill country that he was going to take. And he had this promise of that. And, and he had seen God, uh, you know, bring him through the Red Sea. And that's why he trusted that God was going to do this. We've seen something greater than that. We have seen the Son of God die and come back to life. We have seen the Son of God die and come back to life. And before that, promise that he was going to do it. And then say, look, I'm going to go. I'm going to leave. And when I go, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, the you means you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back again to bring you to be with me where I am. We have this promise, and this promise is greater than anything that Caleb had. Because of this promise, we can see how God will use the hardest things for something great. We can see how God can use the worst things of this world to do something good. How we do not have to live in fear anymore. Crippled 
by the things that no longer get to define our eternity. When we understand that, when we understand that, it changes the way that we see the world. It changes the way that we see, this, see society, society because ultimately we understand that God has placed us here for a purpose, and my hope is not in this world, but it's in his purpose. So I want to ask you one question. How would your life look different if you lived like death had been defeated? How would your life look different if you truly lived like death was not the end? What conversations would you be having today if you truly believe that death like, couldn't harm you ultimately? Look, there are going to be hard days in front of us. But what if that's not the end? How does your life change? What conversations do you have? What calls do you make? If you're no longer scared, who do you call and just talk to about the love of God? Like, look, I, I don't know what this means, but I want you to know that God loves you and that you matter. And I may not have shown that to you well in the past, but I want to show it to you now. Nobody's going to be offended by that. Not when you tell them you love them and then you want to tell them why. This is the truth. This is the reality. When we stop being afraid, we start to see God work. This next year, 2020 was crazy, 2021 has been crazy, 2022 has been crazy, who knows? By the time 2024 comes around, who knows what's going to be happening? I, I don't even want to guess, right? Um, we'll have a worldwide pandemic of, I, I don't know, like fireball hail that's going to come down on us and spread COVID on everything. I don't know what this means, but I do know that Jesus is in front of it and we don't need to be afraid anymore. And so what I want you to know today, my bottom line for today, is that there is no fear in love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For the fear has to do with punishment, but whoever and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We no longer have to be afraid if we truly believe that Jesus is alive and you are a follower of Jesus, you do not have to be afraid anymore. That's why I wanted to share this story with you. It's one of my favorite stories because I see a man who's not any different than you and I. In fact, he's old and I'm getting old. And yet he sees that God is working and he is not scared. So three things that we can do if we understand that we don't have to be afraid anymore. One, same thing Caleb did. Focus on the promise. Focus on the blessing instead of the obstacle. Focus on the promise of God. Focus on the things that God is doing instead of on the things that we're afraid of all the time. God has promised that because Jesus is alive, you get to have life if you're a follower of Jesus. If you have not given your life to Jesus, then today is the day. This promise is for you and for the, the, your family. This is, this is an amazing promise that there is eternity waiting for those who follow Jesus. This is why we have the picture of baptism, of dying to ourselves, so that that is no longer, old life is no longer our future. Focus on the promises of God instead of your fear. Two, trust in God. Trust that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Caleb had to wait. He ended up ultimately having to wait 40 years, 45 years to do what he was promised, but he, he waited it out, and God proved that he is faithful. They're going to have problems. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world, so trust the promises of God. And lastly, and this is the thing I want to finish with, is build up the people around you. Build up the faith of the people around you. That's what Caleb tried to do. He tried to build them up. And we can do this. It's time for us to be people who show other people that God's not done. Tim Keller, who's a minister in, in New York City, he's actually retired. He's fighting cancer right now. Powerful man of God. Was asked, how, how does the church respond in the culture that we're in? How do, how do we respond in this world that seems to be falling apart? And, and, and his response is great. He says, how do you respond to this? First, repent for the ways that Christians' inconsistent lives have harmed the church's credibility. Just be consistent. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. Third, let people know that you are a believer. Don't hide it. Stop hiding the fact that you're a believer. Fourth, make sure that you are not harsh or clumsy in your words. Be sure it's the gospel that offends and not you. Amen. And lastly, do not be afraid of persecution. Jesus promises to be with you. If we truly believe that Jesus is alive and that we have hope, the way that we talk to the people around us changes. The conversations that we have with people changes. 
the name that we wear on our chest when we wear Jesus becomes first and foremost in our lives and we don't have to be afraid anymore. Come on. Doesn't it sound pretty awesome to not be afraid? Almighty God. Lord, we need you. We need your spirit to be powerful in us because we are in a world and a society that is feeding on fear. And it has bled into the church. It's bled into my heart, my own heart. God, I find myself trying to protect things that I have no ability to protect. God, I pray for each one of us that we would not be afraid we would trust your promises that the worst of this world does not get to define us. I thank you for girls like Malia. I thank you for this young woman. I for your grace that's on her that she is walking with you today. I pray that we would follow her example of simple faith. You have placed a calling on us. Help us to live this calling out with our family and our friends and every person we come in contact with. Please, God, give us the boldness to take the hill country, to not rest. I ask in Jesus' name.